We're in the studio, the BI Platform studio, where I'm having a video interview, remote video interview with Barry Devlin, founder of Nineside Consulting. So glad to have you on board, Barry. Great to be here, Wagner. Okay. Um, can you tell us um, what are some important preconditions as, a, as an organization um, that you need to take care of before you start adopting AI capabilities? For sure. Um, look, I think the, the first thing is always, and I'm a data guy, the first thing is always data, data quality, data governance, data quality, data quality. Um, so much of AI depends on the quality and, and indeed the quantity of the data that you're actually using first to train it and then ongoing in, in use. So getting data quality right up front is going to be the difference between success and failure. Um, and it doesn't really matter what type of AI you're using, with almost, uh, with almost no exceptions, um, AI does use a lot of data and the quality of the data determines uh, how your uh, output is going to be. So that's number one, always. Um, perhaps more in the background is about ethics. Um, and that depends a little bit on what it is that you're going to be doing with your AI. But I think a framework and a, a process for doing your ethics is going to be really important. Um, so that if you come across some use of the AI that um, is particularly troublesome or that you wonder, mm, maybe that's something I shouldn't be doing, or that you have a framework, that you have a, a committee, that you have people involved who have thought it through and say, yeah, that's okay, or that's not okay. So having the possibility to go and look at ethics is important as well. And that's sort of related to training, of course, um, whether it's training of your data scientists or training of your ethicists, um, you really do need to make sure that um, you have gone through that process because, you know, this is different from your standard BI and data warehousing stuff. You're really getting into a, a very different area of behaviors. And so making sure that people understand uh, what they're trying to do and how, th how they're going to do it and getting that training done is, is really important. Um, yeah, and, and probably there's one more, um, and that is to, to think about the, what is your, you're trying to achieve? Are there really concrete value that you can see getting from that? What are the benefit areas? And, and try and figure out in advance what it is that you believe you're going to do first. And I'd be thinking, you know, about yeah, a prototype or a, a small project to start with, but it has to have value. It has to give value. Um, so maybe that's a lot of to, to preconditions to be thinking about, but um, yeah, they're the ones that I would, I would put in front of you. Okay, thank you. Um, can you give us some examples of low-hanging fruits for organizations that start on their journey on adopting AI capabilities on top of their data lake, data warehouse and BI environments? Yeah, Werner, that's a, that's a tough question because I think it, it, it differs uh, considerably uh, depending on the industry you're in and indeed depending on the, uh, the area of, of, of um, activity that you're trying to apply AI to. And, and I would say to you that, you know, in a general sense, my feeling is operational BI types of applications um, are the places where, where I would think it's a good place to start. If you have uh, some of those, depending on your industry, whether it's manufacturing or distribution, your supply chain, um, some of your production processes, where you've got some good uh, physical or engineering data, um, that's typically a good place to start. Um, because that data tends to be, um, I suppose, somewhat better quality is somewhat more dependable than data that's coming from other areas, particularly social media. But I think a lot of people do start with social media, data mining, machine learning in the social media data, trying to drive engagement, uh, trying to get automated insights, uh, do customer segmentation. Those are you know, the places where lots of people start because um, AI is sort of a sexy thing and it's the marketing people often who, who think, oh yeah, we're gonna do AI first. Um, but actually, as I say, I think that you know, the operational areas um, tend to be easier to do. And often if you're in that type of business um, that they will get, get you some useful early benefits. Um, you had a session at our conference, the Data Warehousing and BI Summit, last week. 
And in that session, you spoke about the important difference between automation and augmentation. Can you give us some examples of successful and perhaps not so successful of both? Sure, Werner, that's, you're absolutely right. I do focus a lot on the difference between uh, automation and augmentation. But I, I do want to first emphasize before I try and answer your question is that um, I make that distinction so strongly for teaching purposes um, because you know they are ends of two ends of a spectrum. And in fact, when you're doing AI, they often merge in practice when you're doing it. You know, it's a bit of automation and a bit of augmentation in any particular project. So you have to sort of tease apart the project in order to see which parts are automation and which parts are augmentation. So let's, let's do that, uh, first of all. Um, so automation. Um, again, I'm coming back to my operational BI, the, the high speed, the low value, the Im low impact type of decisions that you would typically see in operational BI uh, applications. So this has been going on for ages, you know, and I know it's been there since, since almost the beginning of the 90s when people started doing this. And they started uh, doing particular types of um, if then else type of processes in order to automate some of those operational BI uh, decisions. So applying machine learning and AI to that type of, of process is, is, is a sort of obvious step. And it can be the obvious thing you do uh, in order to, to get value. Um, and since you've already been doing it with your operational BI, it makes some sense to do it again. So that's one area where you say, yeah, automation makes some sense. And as I spoke in, in my presentation, I believe that sort of that, that area of, of decision making, um, operational BI versus tactical or, or um, um, tactical or strategic BI. Um, those, those things are, that area of operational BI is really the, the obvious place to start. I think the, the one that strikes me in terms of automation not being a good thing to do is something I see a lot of going on where um, em employers are starting to try to do um, analysis, pre-validation, if you like, of CVs and job applications, and basically using uh, AI to do an automated scan through, let's say, hundreds of, of CVs in order to, to come down to a, a, a subset that they will actually spend some time on. But I think this is an area that is, is, um, is dangerous because um, there's a lot of uh, personal um, value that goes into CVs that I'm not, not sure that machine learning is actually the right thing to do. So I suspect there will be significant issues uh, rising in this area before long. Um, if I turn to augmentation, um, well, we're seeing a lot of that already, um, application of augmentation in BI tools, in data preparation tools. And, and they show early signs of, of being useful and, and valuable. So I think uh, augmentation is the, is the preferable end of the spectrum when it comes to AI. Um, and I think the reason for that is because it includes people within the process. And including people in the process, of course, is important because employees want to, they want to enjoy their jobs. They want to have something useful to do. And so if you tell them that you're gonna automate their jobs, often they'll resist it because it's a threat to their, to their jobs. It's a threat to their job security. It's also a threat to their, um, you know, to, to their personal uh, value that they get from doing their job. Whereas if you talk to them about augmentation, it becomes much more of a, oh yeah, I could actually benefit from that. This could help me to do my job better. And I could maybe um, tone down on some of the more um, mundane matters and focus on the things that are more important. Okay. Well, AI is taking over more and more decision-making that used to be made by humans, such as the, the Uber algorithm that decides which driver gets your ride. Um, what kind of decisions do you think are always better left to humans, if any? Oh, if any, I, I think the, the, <laughs> the answer is many, many, I think, are better <laughs> left to humans. So um, let's start at the really top end, life and death decisions. Um, you might think that's also uh, um, uh, 
autonomous vehicles. I was going to say Uber, that's probably not the correct answer. Um, autonomous vehicles uh, may be taking life and death decisions, but let's go a little further and say military operations. Do you really want to have um, AI controlling your drones, um, killing people, uh, deciding which people should be killed? I think, no, that should be, well, it shouldn't be done at all, but if you're going to do it, I think real people should be making those decisions. I think then moving down a level, you know, decisions where ethical judgments are involved. So we see AI being applied to sentencing. We see it being applied to parole hearings, perhaps, um, particularly in the States. Um, is that really good? I mean, the, 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 Things that people say is that, you know, it's, it's going to remove bias. But the truth is that these AI um, tools are built upon existing data. We talked about quality earlier and there's bias in that data. And so that bias gets into the AI decisions of sentencing, paroling, police decisions and so on. And that's, that's not a good thing at all. Um, decisions where there are significant economic impacts or on people like social welfare eligibility, uh, financial decisions, should you have a mortgage or not? Um, and I mentioned employment already. All of those must have, I would say, at least a human overview. And um, I think that um, uh, uh, Kate O'Neill's um, book um, is a really good example, so have some really good examples of, um, of these type of problems that arise. Um, her, her book is called Weapons of Math Destruction, really clever name. Um, but um, all of those decisions, she has so many examples of when you put AI, when you put machine learning into that sort of decision-making, you get socially uh, very bad decisions. They really do not do your uh, society any good at all. Um, and I think we really must be careful about where we apply AI in those cases. Okay. We are making tremendous progress with AI in, in, in many areas. Um, however, what do you think will limit the progress and advancements that we have in AI? Yeah, I think, Werner, you're, you're correct. There's a huge amount of advances going on in AI. And I think that makes it difficult to answer that question in the longer term because the field is changing so quickly. Um, new research is coming out every week. In fact, almost every day you get new pieces of information, new, new thoughts, new ways of doing things. But if we take sort of the short term, um, there, are, there are, I suppose there are three areas that I think um, that are going to be limitations. Um, the first um, is about the training data. And here we go again. I'm sorry to be such a, uh, to, to focus so strongly and, and boringly on the training data, on the data that's used for the AI, but the limits in the quality and the quantity of this data are really going to hold back many aspects of AI. And you see this in the research, even that many of the researchers already are looking for ways to try to do AI with smaller amounts of data um, rather than the huge training sets that we already need or that we currently need. But for sure, um, the amount of training data in terms of, and its quality is going to be a, a really limiting factor. Um, a second area is that AI today is very task specific. It's very, what they call narrow AI. So the AI that's developed works for a very specific area, very specific task. Um, and it's very difficult to generalize it from that to a more uh, to a more broader set of problems. So you know, you if you look at, for example, even the game playing AI. So they typically the AI is is trained against one particular game. Um, it may be able to be extended to similar types of games, but. Uh, so, you know, very related sets of games, but it's very difficult to get it then to, get, to go from, let's say, um, from Go to chess. We're seeing some work being done on that. We're seeing some advances in those areas, but it's still a, a difficult problem. AI gets trained on something, but it can't apply it, uh, the learning to some other area. And of course, talking about um, uh, artificial general intelligence, which is, of course, you know, the terminators of this world. Um, we're nowhere near that yet because AI today is really very task specific. And perhaps the one last thing I would mention, which is, um, which is, 
I suppose a little bit surprising, but to some, but not in general sense, power consumption. The amount of power that is consumed in AI processes, particularly the training process today, is huge. Um, it's almost getting as bad as Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, we really can't afford to be um, ex expending so much power and so much energy. Um, we need to find ways of, of doing that uh, better, cheaper, and indeed with a lesser impact on the climate. And this is the funny thing about AI, you know, um, it seems to affect everything. It's, it, does, it affects everything from, you know, the, the basics of speaking to your cell phone all the way up to um, affecting climate change. And, and of course it will help in, in terms of doing some of the analyses in climate change, but if the power consumption is so big that it causes more climate change, more climate emergency, yeah, that's, that's not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, it does, it, it does affect everything indeed. Um, well, a pity we couldn't do this interview face to face in Utrecht last week, but still I enjoyed having the interview with you. Thank you very much, Barry. It's been a pleasure, Werner, and it was also a pleasure to speak uh, virtually in Utrecht uh, last week. Um, I also missed the, uh, the, the personal interaction that you get from these face-to-face uh, -face -face conferences, but one of these days we'll, we'll do it again. We sure will. Okay, thank you very much, Barry. Cheers. Thanks a lot.